I'm going to turn it over to you. Wonderful. And thank you so much, um, Janet, and thank you, Chanel, for taking the time out of your day to learn more about the Master of Science in Community Medicine. Um, my name is Cynthia Martinez, but I go by Cindy. Um, so feel free to call me Dean Martinez, Cindy, anything, I, I or Cynthia. I, I respond to both <laughs> or all, all of the above. Um, so let me begin by, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the Master of Science in Community Medicine, what it is. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the curriculum. Um, and I think that will give you more sneak peek of what to expect in the program. So what is community medicine? Um, when we think about a community defined, that is a collective body of individuals identified by common characteristics. So such as geography, interests, their lived experiences, concerns, or values. So here at KGI, we look at community medicine as both a science and an art. And this is for promoting health, for preventing diseases and prolonging life. Our curriculum focuses on understanding those social determinants of health. What are those local health issues? Um, looking at the community-oriented primary care and the organization of these healthcare services. When this program was designed, we want us always to stay up to date and current with how is the industry changing? And so one of the books that really helped guide um, the direction of where we were taking our community medicine program um, was the American Healthcare Paradox, where it talks a lot about health equity and really what is what has happened and where is the direction that we really need to take it. And so one of the quotes I like at the bottom there from, from the book is, inadequate attention to an investment in services that address the broader determinants of health is the unnamed culprit behind why the US spends so much on healthcare, but continues to lag behind in health concerns. That really was the motivation behind why we saw we, this is not a public health degree that I want to make that very clear. There's nothing wrong with a health, a public health degree, but where it focuses more theoretically, we really look at it as the science and the art to understanding the health equity, the cultural awareness, the cultural sensitivity um, in the community in which we're hoping that our graduates will go on to serve. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of the background and context. So ultimately, our mission is to prepare the skilled physicians and other health professionals. We have students in our program that are on the pre-dental track. We have students who are also thinking about going to PA school and as well, like you mentioned, like yourself, going on to med school. From these underserved and underrepresented communities to partner with those communities to improve health, lower the burdens of illness, and reduce the need for medical care. And as we talk about the curriculum, you'll see that we're very intentional that the people that we want to help these underserved and underrepresented communities, we very much believe that trust is an important element um, in building these communities and actually working towards improving and getting rid of reducing inequalities is if we are training those people that we want to see in the community. I can just share with you my own personal experience, you know, healthcare. I was a first generation college student. I have a father that's an immigrant. How challenging it was to navigate, um, you know, healthcare and the system because we, we, it was very difficult for us to build trust because we weren't identifying with folks who understood some of the burdens and concerns, you know, that we were bringing in. So that's where I think that our mission very much aligns um, with our curriculum. And I'll tell you more. I'll tell you about that now. So where our curriculum is focusing um, to prepare folks for employment or for further health professions education. Um, you don't need to pick which one now. Very, you know, we understand that um, sometimes you may choose to apply to go to med school while you're in the program. You may want to work first and then go to med school. So either pathway is great because this degree gives you an added advantage to make you really stand out um, to med schools when they're looking, you know, at maybe traditional undergrads who are applying right out of undergrad school. This is really going to show a preparation, a maturity, a a commitment and a passion for wanting to help the community. And so you can also work, and I definitely think through even, I'm gonna talk about your capstone experience, is really the signature item of our program that is gonna give you those experiences for either direction that you wanna go into. 
Um, our program is two years where you would enroll in the fall and spring, both your first year and your second year. Um, we originally had started our program with a synchronous, which means that you show up online at a set given time, let's say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. We changed the curriculum because we realized many of our students have jobs or they want to volunteer simultaneously. So we're making changes as we, we change it to asynchronous and we're now making changes in our curriculum to be better suited um, for people who want to continue to work, whether it's full-time, part-time and or volunteer or prepare for the MCAT. So stay tuned for those, for the change in units. Um, our current existing is 54 units to be done in two years, um, but we're reducing those units. And so we will officially announce what those units are once we get official WASC approval, but it with the intention to really make the program more manageable for you. So it's only gonna be a win-win. Um, so nothing changes with the timeline. It's still gonna be two years. And I mentioned it's asynchronous. And that means that you don't have to show up at a set day and time. You would log into our Canvas. And um, one of our signature items is that we have developed this curriculum all using active learning. So I don't know if you were ever participating um, in online class, if you were in your undergraduate or participating in online classes during COVID, I want you to take that image of online learning out of your head. <laughs> that is not our program at all. <laughs> okay, um, we're, during COVID, everyone rushed to do online learning um, and just threw a curriculum, threw a slide deck and put it onto this and said, okay, everyone, let's go into Zoom. Active learning is an approach to instruction that involves actively engaging the students with the course material through discussions, through problem solving, through case studies, through role plays and other methods. So activities within the active learning classroom help promote this higher order thinking, such as knowledge application, analysis and synthesis. Um, active learning places a greater degree of responsibility such as um, I'm sorry, uh, on the learner, then some of these passive approaches, which are more like, okay, read this lecture, regurgitate it. It's the instructor will give the guidance is still critical um, and crucial, but it is not in the graduate level, the sole responsibility of the instructor. They're there to help you unpack these case studies and help you unpack the active learning. And so active learning is very intentional and it was a very intentional for asynchronous learning. So I just wanna stress that again, that it's helping you build community even though you're in this asynchronous environment. So you won't feel that you're in isolation. Um, in fact, I'm hearing from students that it really brought them together. Some of the group work was a shock to some of them. They didn't think that they were still gonna have some group work in asynchronous learning, um, but it's very intentional because it's designed, again, to promote that higher order thinking and to help you build community um, through these assignments with your cohort. So year one um, are the foundational courses where you will be taking um, courses related to the community health. You'll have an understanding of health system sciences. Um, it'll, be, it'll be important for you to understand some of the policies, but we don't have a course that's 100% designed just on laws and policies. And we also have a course on community medicine interventions. And then in your first semester of your first year, you will have a capstone coordinator that's going to be an advisor to you, that's going to schedule times, one-on-one -on -one times with you to talk through what are some of those upstream um, causes that you are interested in learning, um, what would be some organizations that you may be interested in exploring. So you don't identify your capstone in isolation. I know my grad program, they said, okay, go do a capstone and you were on your own. <laughs> so we don't want to do that here. We want to make sure you are getting the support every step of the way. In year two, um, we continue with the foundational courses. Oh, one thing I should mention in year one, is by spring semester of your first year, you will have your capstone identified. If you're having trouble with that, you have that capstone coordinator that's gonna help you. KGI has a very strong network of organizations and we're continuously building on them. And so um, that's where the capstone coordinator and I work very closely together. If she is hearing students, certain students having a specific area or if they're out of state, 
then I reach out to my network. We reach out to um, all of KGI's network to say, let's think of what types of organizations would be the best match. So when you leave in May, if you want to go off, you know, um, and on a vacation over the summer, you don't have to worry about, oh, no, I need a capstone for my second year. We will have everything finalized um, by the end of your second semester of your first year. So we continue with your foundational courses of direct um, to consumer healthcare. And we also have a motivation change in leadership class. Um, it's very important to understand the organization's change readiness, if you will. It's one thing for you to be able to go into an organization, do a needs assessment, identify an intervention, but then the organization may not be change ready. And that's where this course really helps you to understand um, you know, how to diagnose an organization, how to implement a change model, how to sustain the change so that they're, and really minimize some of that resistance. I mean, that truly is leadership. Um, and so what you're doing then in your year two is you're applying everything that you learned in year one while what you're learning in these two other courses um, to be able to put your 10 hours a week into your, com your community. Um, you will have already completed, like I said, that proposal. And so then you're really focusing on doing a needs assessment, which we give you all the tools on how to do that. And you're working to really make this intervention that's going to better serve the community. Um, and then ultimately, then the second um, semester, you'll be writing the final report, you will be putting together the final lit review and putting together the presentation to be able to share with um, your cohort as well as our community. Um, when I say our, our own community, we have um, a board of governors, we have a council of medical school deans that are all very interested in hearing about all of the work that our KGI or stu our students are doing, so this is a great opportunity to showcase it. So I know that I went through a quick overview of what each year looks like. Um, I wanted to say the overarching themes that we are getting from the, 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 remember I said it was the sciences and the art. So when we think of the sciences of community medicine, while our classes may not say Chem 101, Bio 101, right? Why we're not gonna do those traditional undergrad prereq courses, that's not what this program is doing. We are doing more advanced learning when it comes to the health and illness prevention, um, the quantitative analysis that you're going to be doing, looking at the data that's being provided by the organization, really understanding these health systems. What does it mean if someone is on Medi-Cal, Medicare? What does it mean if it, you know, um, there's an organization that is an FQ, you know, uh, federally qualified, you know, health center? So really understanding the different types of health systems is really important. Um, innovation. Innovation is a science. How you are creating these new programs and how we're really helping to change and improve these health inequalities. There's the behavior and the motivation, as you know, coming from a behavioral sciences, you know, background, how important it is to understand the behavior and motivation of the individuals is key. Um, and then those determinants of health, whether it's the socioeconomic conditions, whether it's certain policies and laws, it could be racism, it could be, you know, these, what are those inequalities, it could be lifestyle. So really understanding what are these um, determinants of health is what we're teaching within our curriculum. So all of the courses, including our capstone, seek to develop very, very critical competencies. And it is habits of mind that we like to refer to and habits of heart. Um, so we want you to have the critical thinking. We want you to have the effective communication, um, being able to be very creative in your thinking as well as how you're interacting with others. I know group work might not always be the most favorite thing that students do, but it's gonna be so important to apply what you learn from your groups, even when you're working with a community because that in essence is a group that you're gonna be working with. And then the habits of heart um, within healthcare, how important it is, whether you are an MD or you're working, let's say, at a health education center, um, how important it is to have the decency, the resilience, and the maturity. And that's what we're looking for for students to understand that it's a grad school, it's a grad program. It was not designed to be easy. It was designed to challenge your way of thinking, and it was to expand your skill set and your competencies, which are going to make you more marketable, um, whether it's to an employer or whether it's to go on to med school. 
Um, so when we are thinking of community health, which is a huge component of our curriculum, this is to understand the health in any community. So you're going to learn to explore several basic questions anytime you enter into um, a community and trying to understand and diagnose. That was that diagnose piece of just understanding the community is what are the major health problems that are happening? Um, asking why are they happening? What could be those upstream causes? Could it be these social determinants of health that are causing certain um, things to be happening? What is the evidence to support these conclusions and how reliable is it? What resources exist in the community to build on? And how can these conditions be prevented or their impact reduced? So these are all things from the community health perspective when we look at our Masters of Science in Community Medicine that are really gonna make you stand apart. Um, this curriculum was thoroughly reviewed and vetted from this council of medical school deans of us asking them, what is it that you are looking for in your future physicians, your future medical school students, as well as looking at as our employers and asking them, what are those skill sets that you're looking for? And these are all of that critical thinking, these questions that they're hoping that our graduates will really know how to do. And we're very confident that our curriculum does that. Health system management is another piece of it, where this is to work and improve a health system. The students are gonna learn how to understand and develop and manage budgets. Um, how, you know, you, you're going to be creating this intervention, but how successful will it be if it, it's not sustainable, if you don't have the funding to be able to do something. Um, so we have a great course where we talk about different new, new ventures, joint ventures. Um, we even have in one of our courses, like a mini shark tank, where we actually have healthcare um, entrepreneurs who will be judges um, about in, in your course as you think of a new healthcare venture based off of a social upstream, social determinants of health concern. You're gonna learn how to organize and implement different projects. You're gonna continuously learn how to improve programs and the services that are being offered. Um, and then the direct to consumer care is a really important element. Um, and we really look to um, the understanding of what is really precision health? And I think this is a really impactful quote, and this is coming from the Dean from Stanford School of Medicine, where he says, we are in the middle of a revolution in the science and technology related to the mechanisms of disease and of equal importance to the determinants of health and well-being. The impact of these advances and their broad dissemination are going to have a profound, I want to emphasize, a profound effect on our ability not just to treat diseases, but to prevent them from developing in the first place. And that's where the community medicine program really fits in, is as you are doing a needs assessment and you're identifying an intervention, many of the things that you're going to be doing is really thinking about how are we going to prevent some of these issues from even occurring in the first place? How can we get rid of these barriers? So really thinking about the direct to consumer healthcare, it's to create solutions for healthcare consumers. You're gonna learn how to determine what solutions have been tried, what has been their impact, and what has been their barriers to reaching scale. And by scale, we mean, is it even sustainable, right? Like, are we, is it able to be scalable, meaning as things continue to grow and change? And identify what the health consumer needs and wants. Where things are constantly changing. This world where is, is changing all the time. And so it's really important to think about the health consumer as we're studying. Um, you're gonna choose the problem to address. You're gonna create and test the solution to see if it's viable. And you're gonna adapt and improve the solution that's in practice. So that's really our direct to consumer healthcare course. And I talked to you about why motivation change and leadership is important. And one of the things I want to share is our founding dean um, for the program, Dr. Dave Lawrence, was the former CEO of Kaiser. And he wrote a book about the best care, best future. And this is a book that is guiding us through the motivation change and leadership because he shares examples when he was CEO of Kaiser um, and you know, as a practicing MD one of the things um, he gives case studies throughout of how certain issues really involved him to really think about the motivation behind why you're doing 
you know, certain needs assessments or creating these interventions, um, change and leadership. And so you're gonna motivate people to change their health behaviors. You're gonna to learn to organize and support change and you're gonna to learn to lead and follow effectively. Um, and there's definitely a difference between a manager and a leader. We make sure that we emphasize that um, in our program because we want you to be leaders in the healthcare industry. Our community medicine interventions, I wanna highlight, um, we have a nutrition and health class. Um, we're seeing this as a growing trend in our society of the lack of nutrition and health that is made available. Um, so we, in this course, you learn the relationship between lifestyle and socioeconomic conditions and the nutrition, health, and well-being of the individual. In our precision health and community medicine class, this is going through the different scientific advances and the computational tools that are used to help improve health for individuals, families, and communities. And so I mentioned that the focus of the capstone experience is to provide you with hands-on learning and it's on building relationships and really deepening your understanding of the community. So again, this capstone one that's during your first year, you'll learn the tools for assessing a community's social context, their health concerns and their problems and what the upstream cause of the concern and problem is. And then in that year two, that's where you will focus on selecting your specific community. You'll pick one specific upstream cause, and then you're either gonna organize a program to address that concern, or you'll join a program in the community that's already underway. Um, so again, the capstone one is just really helping you gather what is the healthcare story. And then in capstone two, this is where you're creating and imp implementing that, that intervention. And I wanted to share with you some examples of our current students who are now in their second year, who are doing their capstone projects. Um, the images reflect the name of the organization. Um, we have 20 students in the program, so this by no means is the exhaustive list. This is just as many images I could fit on one slide and to give you just a diverse representation. So for example, if we look at Project More, which is the M with the plus, um, their propo proposal for their capstone was to reduce the spread of infectious disease among young adults of the LGBTQ community um, in the Bay Area of Northern California. You see Park Tree, um, which is to the left, um, and that is a federally qualified community center. And our student is looking to improve vaccination rates and well child visit attendance for pediatric patients aged zero to two and a half years old. We also have an organization right smack in the middle, which is Nuestra Catura. And this capstone project aims to increase the knowledge of preventative care for type two diabetes and self-management skills for those diagnosed with type two diabetes. And then I'll just do a couple more um, helping hands. That one is on the prevalence of type two diabetes specific to the Latinx community. And Altamed is adverse childhood experiences um, with community support. And this is a look at their case management system. So it's really just up to you as what it is that you're interested in and what your passion is about what difference it is that you're looking to make within your community. So I just wanted to share a couple of those. Um, the Charles Drew is a street mobile clinic that they're working on to improve. And so I just wanted the last thing that I'll say is um, we offer pre-health advising. We also offer um, a number of opportunities for networking events. Um, so from the moment that you are intending that you commit to coming to KGI, we will reach out and talk to you about pre-health advising. We'll want to identify what prerequisites have you already taken for med school. Um, we'll talk to you about preparation for med school admission test, the MCAT. Uh, I hear it opens up tomorrow. <laughs> If you want to sign up, it opens up tomorrow for, um, to, to set your date, um, to commit you, right, to taking the MCAT. But if you're not ready yet, don't worry, it's going to come around again. <laughs> um, med visitation days. We have a network of medical schools that they will come to our campus and talk to our students. Um, about um, their medical school application process. It's also going to be an opportunity for them to firsthand see the presentations of our students to hear the amazing work that our KGI students are doing. Um, we also provide mock interviews for your med school. We understand that you'll have, you know, primaries and then you'll get called for secondaries. 
um, help you through with your personal statement, with how you're going to answer some of those secondary responses. And we, again, want to expand your network, regardless if you go to med school or not, or you stay in the community. It's very important within the healthcare industry um, that you start building your network of professionals. So we will create online Zoom, you know, because it's an asynchronous program. We have students coming from all across, you know, the U.S., um, that we will provide opportunities for you to network and meet with folks, whether it's um, somebody who created, their, they're an entrepreneur within the health sector and they created their own opportunities, um, whether it's somebody who is a dean of a medical school or former dean or president of a med school, whether it is somebody who has worked in healthcare, we have on our board of governors, we do have some um, MPHs. Um, we have surgeon generals for this uh, for the U.S. who are on our board of governors. So we have a wealth of knowledge and information um, of a network, and they're all willing to network with our students. So we try to provide as many opportunities as we can. I think that definitely sets us apart um, from other institutions. So what do you think? Are you all are you ready? Are you ready to join KGI? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> And so now the rest of the time is yours um, to ask any questions that you might have about the program. Um, I just have like a couple of questions. Um, so I know in the beginning you said it's like pretty much different from like a public health degree and like the community health. Um, so what are those like main differences would you say is like, um, like acquired from this like master's program? Great question. Um, I definitely think a master's of public health focuses on law and policy. And it's going to give you a very theoretical lens where the community medicine is applying what you're learning versus it's about theory, right? We're not having you read theoretical models. We're having you read case studies of what's really happening in the healthcare industry now as we speak. Um, so I think that um, when we look at these foundational courses, really understanding the direct-to-consumer healthcare system, um, when we think of in, you know, like year one, you're learning about um, these health system sciences, you're understanding interventions. So that's where it's more hands-on and it's more applicable. That's why I like the basic science of community medicine and where we're thinking of more the, the habit of mind and the habits of heart. It's more about the person and at an individual level so that we can then think about the whole community as a whole, but you can't do that unless you start from the humanistic piece of things. Um, so I think that if you learn, wanting to learn a lot more theories, a lot more policies, and don't get me wrong, I think both are very, very important. And so that's why we do cover some policies that are important for you to know, but that is not the foundation of what our program is. Okay, thank you. Of course. Um, another question is, is um, so, I saw that there's no requirement for like, I guess, um, standardized testing. Is that the same for like MCAT, GREs, stuff like that? Or is it like, um, does there's no requirement for standardized testing to apply? I'm gonna let Janet answer that one. So for um, MSCM, let me just look it up and make sure I have the right application requirements. But if you ever would like to see any updates on um, deadlines and items like that, just ensuring that you have everything in order, I highly suggest checking out our website. Our website would have the most up-to-date information um, or contacting our admissions team. But let me look through. And there is none. So the only requirements are your personal statement, resume, letter of recommendation, transcripts, and the application fee. If you do need any um, assistance with the application fee, you can always email our admissions team and we can get that set up for you if possible. Okay. And um, so like upon um, submitting the application, and since there is that, um, the interview portion, how soon will we be notified of like when the interview would be taking place upon like submission? So the application for this program is rolling. The deadline is May 1st. Um, the application priority deadline is May 1st. So as long as you um, submit your application by the deadline, yes, there's the website. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Um, Then, 
afterwards you would be able to hear from the admissions team. Obviously, we'll take a little bit of time for the admissions team to review the application as well. Okay. And um, so this uh, next question um, relates to the capstone. So for the capstone, um, is it, are the students typically um, doing the capstone within their own like city or their own town or they do you see them going out and like commuting to other locations to um, complete that capstone experience? Yeah, great question. Um, out of convenience, students prefer to do their own community where it is that they live. However, they if they, through our program, what I have seen is some students become very passionate about one of the upstream causes that they're identifying within healthcare, that they're realizing perhaps maybe it's not prevalent in their current community. So some of them make arrangements to be able to identify something outside of their community. And that's completely your choice. We do not require you, we don't tell you, you have to stay within your community. The only challenge I think would be funding. Like if you identified a community that was long distance, I can't guarantee that there'll be funding from the school to be able to do that. However, some organizations, we just had a student who's from um, San Diego County who was looking to do a capstone in her area based off of what she wanted to do. And she really wasn't identifying anything. Um, I was able to help her identify a program that is um, in New Jersey. And the organization said, we will pay for you to come down once in the fall and once for the spring and pay for all of your housing. And they said, you can do it remotely, but we do think you need that patient interaction, that clinical experience. So we will pay for you to do it once in the fall, once in the spring. And so she um, jumped on that and said, yes, that'll work. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions. I guess something I can formulate right now. So um yeah. Hello. Those are great questions, Chanel. I look forward to getting to know you more. Hi, Edward. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a Paul. I apologize if I'm a little late. I I misread the email and I could have sworn it it said five. So that's completely my bad. But yeah, I'm here now. No, and we finished early. So Edward, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you. Um, where are, did you just finish your undergrad? Where did you do your undergrad? What was your major as an undergrad? Yeah, um, I actually, um, I'm still in my undergrad. I currently go to UCSB and I'm in my fourth year. So I'm about to finish up in the next, uh, hopefully in the next two quarters, because right now we're in the fall quarter. But yeah, um, I am, well, I'm basically a fourth year now. I was looking to, um, I, my original plans um, was to go to med school, like right after, um, you know, graduating and everything. But then I decided that um, I kind of wanted to pursue a master's first. So yeah, um, I had signed my, I signed myself up through, I had heard about um, the master's of science in community and community medicine through, um, through COPE from like the health scholars program. Yeah. So like, yeah, I did, I attended that webinar and I kind of just wanted to get like a more specific feel for it. So yeah, I signed up for this one and I kind of just wanted to learn more about it. And yeah, that's basically all there is to me. Wonderful, no, thank you. And I can, um, I can go through um, a little bit more. I don't, don't want to I know, Chanel, you've already heard the whole presentation. I won't go through all of it. Um, so what I can do um, is, can you see like the what is community medicine, Edward? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so I don't need to go through every single slide, um, especially since you said you already went through a webinar with COPE. Um, but where we, you jumped in, I believe, was when Chanel was asking the question about the difference between an MPH um, and the MSCM, the Community Medicine Program. And so, okay, so one thing I think is really important to distinguish us is that we were very intentional um, in building the program. It was not just a bunch of faculty in a room and said, oh, let's pick this class, let's pick this other class. Um, we had a council of advisors of medical school deans really helping us to um, identify what were the biggest gaps. And one of the things that really came out was, you know, we talk so much about wanting to, 
um, improve the inequalities that are helping within the healthcare system. But sadly, we're not draw, we're not attracting and admitting the students who are coming from these underrepresented areas who are helping to build trust within the communities. We want to admit students um, who we want to see give back into their community, and so hence why we didn't name it an MPH. Um, so we very much, um, one of our council medical school deans is actually on the, um, I'm going to mess up the name, the American, it's AAMC is the acronym, but the American Association for Medical School Colleges, um, he's one of our trusted advisors, and he's the one really that's saying, like, you need to get in front of all of the medical school deans and tell them about this program, because it's so cutting edge, it's so innovative, you are doing everything that you, we want to see in the next generation of med school applicants. Um, so you're doing the right thing, Edward, by really understanding the future of healthcare, and I think you're really going to get that from this program. Um, so I don't have to read it to you, but really this is what our mission is. Um, we really are trying to do a curriculum that's going to give you all of the skill sets um, to best prepare you. And some students are even saying, you know, like I have some students who took the MCAT already. They focused while they were in the program studying for the MCAT, but they're not applying the cycle. They want to work given the experience that they have now working in a community. Um, they want to be employable. And so that's what we're doing. We're employing, we're preparing students for both for employment, as well as really understanding, you know, the future of the health profession for you to advance your education. Um, so this is a two year program. It's completely asynchronous, which means that you do not need to log in at a set time on a specific day. You can continue to work while doing this program. Um, it used to be 54 credit hours. We've reduced that significantly. Um, I can't officially save the number of units until we officially get it approved through WASC. We're going through review right now, but when you start fall 2023, it will be manageable. It will be manageable for you um, to still continue to work, still continue to volunteer, continue to study for the MCAT, mm -hmm. um, continue to meet with a pre-health advisor that we're going to give you, and really network to really build your community to prepare you um, for the healthcare field. Um, what's unique from our program is active learning. Um, and what I was sharing with Chanel earlier is that active learning, um, and when you think of online learning, everything that you may have done when we had COVID and you switch from in-person to online is not what we are. <laughs> so take that out of your head. Okay. It is not, let me put the slide deck on and you just read it and then you're done. That is not what we designed. Mm -hmm. We were very intentional in creating an online program that had active learning and this is course material through discussion boards, through problem solving, through case studies, through role plays, um, where you are going to have an active learning classroom to help promote that higher order thinking, um, where it's going to be that knowledge application, where it's going to be the analysis and synthesis. Um, so active learning places is greater degree of responsibility on you as the learner than the passive approach, which is the lectures. But the instructor guidance is still very crucial. And so what we've learned from our cohorts is that they very much want to engage with their faculty. And so one of the mistakes that we did when we converted from synchronous to asynchronous is that we didn't put in the schedule designated live sessions to meet with your faculty. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be completely optional. Um, they're likely going to be in the evenings for those that have to work full time, but you would know the dates at the beginning of every semester and we would be strategic about not having them all on the same day and time. Um, so they would have to report what their optional live session, it won't necessarily be every week, it'll likely be after every module or lesson plan. So you will have engagement with our faculty, I will tell you, and it's not only because um, they're in the program, obviously I'm the dean for, uh, but they're very impressive. We have MDs who are teaching the courses. We have a, um, someone who has their PhD and is now in DO school. And so he's able to provide support and advising to our students as well as they're thinking about, well, should I do MD? Should I do DO? Um, so I think we have a lot of signature items that really make us stand apart. 
Um, so yeah, so our courses, you know, we have the foundational courses you can see here. Our capstone definitely is the signature item of our program where you are doing a needs assessment, identifying a health um, intervention. How do you make it sustainable? I think you came in when Chanel and I were talking about habits of mind, habits of heart, um, and we kind of walk through each of the courses. So you can kind of go back, excuse me, I'm getting a little tickle. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Too much talking. <coughs> Hold on. Ah, so sorry. Edward, that was my cue to stop talking. Oh, that's completely fine. <laughs> um, as I catch my breath, what questions do you have for me? Yeah, um, I had a question um, and kind of like, I guess like you kind of kind of already answered a bit, but um, I was also kind of just like debating it since like um, I am going to graduate soon, but like I was wondering, like, what are kind of like the key differences between like, like, what would be like um, the benefits with uh, this program as compared to like, maybe like a post back program or something or like, or something like that? Okay, let's see if I don't <laughs> start coughing again. Um, so I think that so there's different post-bac programs. I think that's where I'm, I'm delaying a bit. Right. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, one-year post-bac programs. Why, I'm losing my voice, hold up. <laughs> okay, so there are one-year post-bac programs which give you a certificate. Mm -hmm. Something um, that's important to understand with the post-bac <clears throat> is, <clears throat> excuse me, Sometimes people do one year post backs when maybe their undergrad GPA <clears throat> wasn't, I'm really losing my voice, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Their GPA maybe wasn't so strong. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to do a post back program to advance their science, maybe GPA. Mm -hmm. Not all post backs will do advanced science classes, <clears throat> some of them will have distinguishing factors. So our post back program here at KGI, that's one year, which is only a certificate, it's not a master's degree, will give you some more advanced science. Again, they're not fulfilling necessarily any prereqs for med school. Right. And they'll also give you some business classes. So your, when you apply for med school, your science GPA is one thing, your undergrad GPA is one thing, mm -hmm. but you also have a grad GPA portion section. And so that's where some people, if they're only trying to improve the undergrad GPA, sometimes a one-year post-bac might help. Okay. But there are times when, <clears throat> even if you only did one year, and sometimes some of our post-bac programs will find this out, they end up realizing they need now a second year, mm -hmm. right? And many post-bac certificates, you don't qualify for federal funds because you, if you took them out as an undergrad, Whereas if you do a master's program, you there is federal loans available at the grad level, right? Whereas you don't get those with the certificate. Mm -hmm. With one year certificate, it's not a higher level degree, it's just a certificate. Right. Whereas the master's then shows you, you actually now have a graduate level de um, degree, which is gonna help you stand apart from someone who just has an undergrad and is applying to med school. Mm -hmm. And it's also the content that you're learning. And so some post backs are a master's program. Like I know um, one of our partners, you know, one of our schools we have a really good relationship with, another a med school, they have a master's program that's one year. <clears throat> but again, they don't claim to do any advanced science classes, but it will show a um, a separate GPA for your G for your grad program. Right. So my advice to you, Edward and anyone that's listening to the webinar later, is 
you each individually are going to have your own motivations and reasons and your own, um, like you have to make an informed decision based off of all data points. Mm -hmm. So for some people, a one-year certificate works some financially that doesn't make any sense for them to do it. And they really should look at a graduate program because at the end of it, the loan, the invest on invest, the invest on the, what is it called? The return on investment ends up being higher with a graduate degree than it does a certificate. But for some people that doesn't matter to them. So it's like a trade-off. So I can't really speak to what would be best for you, Edward. Right, right. But I do think that you need to ask yourself ultimately, what is it that you want to get out? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, So I'm curious. I'm really curious of like, as you're debating about programs, like, do you see like one that you are leaning more towards? And, and I'm just curious, like what that would be for you. Is it just a shorter amount of time? Um, not re- um, for me, the time is, a, the time's kind of irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's just mostly, yeah, I've been thinking about that, um, about that too. And, um, you kind of like, like, kind of like opened up my mindset a little bit as well, but for me, it's not necessarily the timing. And like boosting my undergrad GPA would help for like some science classes. But at the end of the day, I just kind of like realized for myself or like what I've kind of realized is like, I feel like um, I feel like I would benefit more through a master's program because one, um, I feel like the federal, like being able to get federal loans and like financial aid for a master's programs makes more sense than um, not, quali- not qualifying for anything through like a post bag program. And um, yeah, so I was, I think like I was leaning more towards the master's program just cause I felt like um, even though, yeah, my science GPA like may not be like the strongest like thing, like the strongest suit, at least I can try to make it up through like a grad GPA. So yeah. like, I guess in my mind, it kind of balances out. Yeah, for sure. And I think a really good, um, I'm sure you're probably familiar already. I believe it's MSAR which walks you through all the med school application requirements and it breaks down for you what they look for as far as like the how the grad GPA is calculated in there. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be really important for you to look at too. Right. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. And then uh, the support so- you're going to get, right? With personal statements and <clears throat> the pre-health advising, I think, and um, the fact that it can all be done online. Like, are you planning to stay in Santa Barbara or are you planning to move like back home, wherever home is? Yeah, um, for at least a year, I was thinking of just staying in Santa Barbara and just kind of, you know, um, just kind of staying out here just because I have, like, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm kind of settled up here, so it just feels weird to just, like, kind of get up and move after, like, graduating, and it just feels kind of like, you know, it just feels kind of clunky, or it doesn't really make that much sense to just, like, up, get up and move yeah. when I'm already kind of, right? like, I've gotten used to life here and everything like that. And it's so beautiful in Santa Barbara. Let's just be real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Mm. Um, I also had a question um, regarding, um, I think you mentioned it a little bit, but um, the financial part of um, the master's program in itself. So like um, for this master's, for um, this particular master's program, is it, um, what it, is it, is it based, is it like a needs-based program in terms of the financial aid? And would I also, because it's also like a master's program, like does FAFSA still, is FAFSA still applicable in this case? You would, I don't want to speak for financial aid and I don't know how much Janet, you know, from admissions, <clears throat> but you do, would fill out the FAFSA. Um, okay. All students would need to fill out the FAFSA to qualify for federal loans. So at the okay. graduate level, it is all federal loans. Right, right. Um, we do have some private donors as well as some Um, public organization and foundation donors, which could give some scholarship, but it does not cover your full tuition. Mm -hmm. But we do have some scholarships, um, institutional scholarships that are based off of public and private um, foundation and donors that are available. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Thank Um, you, Janet. Yeah, I added in um, the chat. If you go onto our website under admissions and aid, under funding your degree, there's actually a chart on there. And under MSCM, you can see, I hope I aligned it right, but under MSCM, you can see that there are federal loans, federal work study, and private loans available. Okay. Yeah, but our um, financial aid team would help you 
um, with funding your degree, ensuring that you understand like what options are available for you as well. Yeah, okay. and at a private institution, um, it is very common to see your graduate tuition be anywhere from you know, 40,000 to almost 60, 70,000 for your, you know, your total annual tuition. Um, and at the MSCM, we've been, we're very intentional of wanting to make a cost-effective program, especially since we know that some students are going to go on to other health professional degrees that are going to have to take out even more loans. Um, so, I believe on the link that Janet shared, you'll see the Master of Science in Community Medicine, our total annual tuition um, is 32,000. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually what the price is for a one year like post bac program. But you're gonna um, be able to now, you know, get a master's degree, you know, each year if you're paying the 32. Um, so it'll be, it'll be it, like the return on investment, I think will definitely be there. Um, right. I had, we've been looking at, the type of careers that some of our graduates, <clears throat> excuse me, would be going to. Um, and we've seen, let me see if I can pull it up really quickly. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I, I don't know what happened with me. <laughs> um, looking at some of these examples of positions and titles of some of the jobs that our students are currently looking at, um, it ranges from a public health advisor, a health equity analyst, a community health researcher, a clinical research coordinator, community health worker, a health educator. Um, and those salaries, if you think about like your total for your two years, let's say it's like 64, 65,000. Um, we're looking at jobs that are ranging anywhere from like 75,000 to $130,000. So that return and investment for a master's degree in community medicine and the type of jobs that you would be applying for, let's say if you decide not to go to med school, or you need another one year, at least you will be that return on investment will be worth it for you because right, you now right. have this master's degree. And these are all jobs that require a master's degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, I do uh, one more, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I do have one more question before we go. So um, in terms of the pre-health advising, like the options incorporated into the program itself, since it is a online asynchronous like curriculum, is it possible to um, at least arrange some in-person events like meetups during like that time while we're in the program? Or is it strictly like everything has to be online? Um, you know, it's interesting. It depends on where you're coming from. So like um, for example, um, we have at orientation. The first point of orientation, we made it optional because we realized that funding may be an issue. We don't have in part of your tuition, we did not include flying you out, paying for your hotel. It was purely the academics piece of it, right? The operating budget to, to teach these courses. Um, so we did make it optional um, for our students to come to campus for orientation and majority of them did. Um, they all came, they knew in advance. One orientation was they came in person, they created a group me, got everyone's information. And some of them that were local, they continue actually to come to KGI at least once a month to meet up that are local within the area. Now, of course, for Edward, this would be really hard for you. Chanel, I didn't ask you where your home is. Where's your oh, hometown? I'm in Santa Rosa. Okay, so that would be hard, right, to come to campus every month on your own. Um, so that's why we do make everything available, like the networking events, the pre-health advising, we do make them um, all virtual. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I love the idea of building community in person. I'm just being cautious because of the financial responsibility that's tied with that. Um, we don't have that funding. Um, I am currently constantly fundraising. So if I ever did come and fundraise, that'd be a great reason to, to say I need some funding to at least bring the students down for once a semester, but then scheduling is going to be a nightmare. What day is going to work for everyone? Mm -hmm. I love the idea though. I love, so I think orientation would definitely be um, a great time. And then you're going to have to come down anyway for commencement. <laughs> yeah. okay. at the end of the program. And that's not unique, honestly. I've been part of an online teaching in an online program for over 10 years. And the first time people see each other often is at commencement. And it's like, ah, oh, I thought you were a lot taller than what you really are. <laughs> okay. 
Um, but yes, I definitely think, and then we do program check-ins all the time, which helps build community. Every month we meet as a cohort. Um, and so that's how you're building community as well within your cohort. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Oh, um, I had, I just like thought of a question just right now um, with like, cause I had mentioned the pre-health like advising and just like having the, uh, essentially like an academic advisor kind of like on hand for throughout this program. Uh, I had a, like, uh, I, I don't know if you'd be able to answer this, but I had a question we kind of regarded in that as well. Just like for like the academic advising and everything, like, would it be possible like, um, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is just like, like through the academic advising, for like um, provided through this program, like, would you be able to like find kind of like research opportunities and like volunteer opportunities kind of like either like within the area or like, as you kind of mentioned with the capsule, like, would you, um, is it through like the academic advisor, you'd be able to find opportunities to like, kind of like venture out and like explore like different communities and kind of like do research in those communities as well. Yes, yes. So we actually have a capstone coordinator, which is des designated just for the capstone experience. And so that will be very different than <clears throat> your pre-health advisor. I often tell students at orientation is that I look at you as the CEO of your education. And a CEO doesn't work in isolation. They have to create their board of directors, if you will, or the board of governors. And they have to put different people on their cabinet or on their board to help them make these informed decisions. So your pre-health advisor is going to be one person on your board. Our okay. capstone coordinator is going to be another person on your board. You can put me and the assistant program director on your boards, right? Definitely, if you're thinking of a job, someone from our career, you, um, our, our, our central career, our KGI career services on your board right for different reasons based off of different times so I say all of that as collectively your board if you're telling us you know I really want some research experience and this is what I want research experience in we're such a high touch private institution we would then go to our network of who we have here at KGI who's doing research and who you're in Santa Barbara so is there any research that you could be doing while you're there so we make mm -hmm. it very individualized Right, right. Some things will align, some things may not align, where we may have to say, let's look up who our contacts are in Santa Barbara, because there's no way we could give him a virtual, if you will, research experience. Let's go see who our contacts are in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so no, that's what your whole board of directors is, is. You tell us, Edward, you tell us, Chanel, you tell us, you know, any individual listening to this call, um, is you are going to get a very hands-on individualized advising experience here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, don't compare us to your undergrad experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we're I much think... smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, and honestly, I'm going to tell you, that's why I got it. I didn't tell you anything about me. You know, I went to Cal Poly Pomona. I was a bio pre-med major, first generation college student, youngest of four. And my maiden name um, is Vasquez. And I found out at my Cal Poly graduation that I was the first ever Vasquez to even graduate with a college degree. And so that's what got me to go into higher education. I thought I was going to go to med school right? Life throws you curveballs, expenses. KGI did not exist when I was an undergrad. And I ended up choosing a commitment to higher education and paying it forward. So I've come full circle now as the dean for the School of Community Medicine to say, I'm going to make sure I have a vested interest in each and every one of you to do what you want to do and get to where you want to be. Right, so. right. I compare it to my experience at Cal Poly. Sorry, Cal Poly, I love you, but uh, right? You didn't get that at a big school where faculty no. were all about their own research. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to get a very unique experience here. Well, I will only hire people who want to set you up for success. That's really reassuring. Yeah, just because, like, I mean, I, UCSB is also really um, kind of a really big school. So it's like, I haven't, I guess, like, I haven't had like the, the, the best experience with like academic advising so it's always just been kind of, it's really really strange to hear that it's like very individualized and very specific towards like you know like <clears throat> excuse me uh like towards like the individual's needs so i really i really enjoy, um, enjoyed hearing that aspect about that great and i come from a very student-centered perspective prior to being the dean of community medicine i came from a very non-traditional where i didn't go to med school but i was the dean of students here at kgi 
Right. So I very much come very student focused to make sure you're getting the resources and the support to help you to be successful. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, well it looks like we've you. reached, yeah, time boundary. Great conversation. Yeah, thank you both for attending today. We really appreciate it. Again, um, my email is in the chat, Janet, down on, uh, Janet underscore donut, kgi.edu. If you have any other questions, want any other links, please let us know. Thank you so much, Dean Martinez, for being here today. And Dean Martinez also put her email in the chat. So please feel free to reach out to Dean Martinez as well. We really appreciate you both. And we wish you both the best of luck in your journeys. We want the best for you both. And we hope to see you here at KGI. Yes. Now we hope we'll see you. We'll <laughs> we see will you. see you we here. We will see you. And we'll we will start you. your pre-health advising right away. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> So much. Thank yes, you so much. Well, thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great night. Okay, bye. 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 bye.